Thank you, thank you for the introduction. It's um, my real pleasure to have the opportunity to share a, a portion of my life's journey with you, particularly as you all join together as women on this woman's journey. Um, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the, such an honor to share my story. My wife and daughter is, uh, are here. Um, the story that I share is partly their story, so of course I do so with their permission. Now, you should know something. My wife loves to hear me tell stories. I'm the storyteller. Um, but I think she's here for another reason. You know, recently I was going to do a case, and there was a nurse who had never worked with me before, and um, she asked me a really curious question. She said, so Dr. Boahene, where are you from? Now, I answer that question maybe four times a day. Maybe it's because of my southern accent. <laughs> um, so I said, I'm from Ghana. Nothing unusual about that. But her next question was quite strange. So she said, so how many wives do you have? <laughs> now, to, to her credit, she was working with me for the first time. She had gone on the internet to research my background, to build good rapport. She wanted to know a little bit about myself. So she said, you know, I went on the internet. You never know what WikiLeaks leaks these days, you know? She said, I found out that you're from Africa. I said, that's true, Ghana to be specific. But I also saw, found out that in some African societies, men can have many wives. So how many do you have? Now, I laughed and I explained that on that vast continent, while that may be true in some areas, in my family, and I have a big family, I have seven siblings, we've only had two grandmothers, we have one mother, and all my brothers each have one wife. <laughs> now, I went home that evening to share what I thought was a funny story with my wife. <laughs> she, she didn't find that amusing at all. I wonder why. She, she said, and all along I thought you were going to medical conferences. Yeah. So, so we all know why she's here today. Yeah. Um, my, my wife was born in Ghana. She grew up in New Zealand. The story about how we met is really romantic and an amazing one that I wrote in a book recently that was published. The title that I chose for the book is part of an African proverb. And it says, however far a stream flows, it never forgets its source. Now, I chose that title because it really depicts my life's journey, a journey that started from Ghana, where I was born and grew up till age 20, before I moved to the Soviet Union as a student. And then as I escaped across the borders of Eastern Europe, first stopping in Poland, then going to London, I worked and lived there for about three or four months, earning my passage to the United States. Now, throughout that journey, there have been many twists and turns, which I've written about and I would love to share with you. But what I most want to talk about is the idea that small acts, small deeds, and small things can make a big impact, both for good and ill. For example, the tiny mosquito is the most lethal creature on earth. Nothing even comes close. Mosquitoes kill one in five children in Africa from malaria before they turn age five. And I'm sure today you're gonna to hear about the Zika virus. Now, rather than talk about the scourge of malaria, what I want to talk to you about is the small deeds and the small acts that people did for me to help me achieve my improbable dream. Things that people I call my Samaritans, the things they did, the encouraging words that they told me when I needed it most, the help they, they, help, they gave me to push me up, what we call in Africa the proverbial tree as you climb up. As early as I could remember, the dream that I had as a child was to become a doctor. Now, Talking about dreams, there is something special about dreams. They are free, right? But the hassle to achieve that dream, those are sold separately. Now, you, you can dream to be whoever you want. You can dream beyond your borders. 
the borders that your circumstances may set around you, the things people tell that you can and cannot do. For an African, dreaming to be a doctor is nothing unusual. We usually want to be either a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. Why? Because that's the dreams our parents want for us. If you know any African family, you're going to be a doctor, and that's it. But my desire to be a physician may have been a subconscious accumulation of many experiences. When I was eight years old, my parents bought for me a set of encyclopedia. And as I lived through those books, uh, an entry caught my attention. It's a, it's a story about a, a father who worked in a drugstore, his sons who became doctors, and together they set up a family clinic that became one of the most prominent medical institutions in the Midwest. Now, that story struck a chord in me because my dad owned a drugstore, and as long as I could remember, I helped him dispense medication. So I went to them and said, Dad, when I grow up, I want to be a doctor, and I'm going to work at that Midwestern hospital. Now, that's a dream an eight-year-old will have because little did I know how improbable that was. I also thought maybe my other brothers could be, uh, sisters could be doctors, and we together we can form our family clinic. But I think there may have been some other reasons why I wanted to be a physician. You know, like the Disney character Simba. If you live among lions, you want to be the Lion King, right? And when you've lived through a famine like I did in 1983 in Ghana, you want to be a farmer. But when people who are close to you, your family members, your friends, people you go to school with, die so young around you, you wish you were a healer. You want to be a doctor. So more than help my parents dispense medications, I wanted to be a physician. Till the age of nine, my best friend was a boy called Joe. Joe was the one that I played with every day after school. He was the one that I would race paper boats in gutters when it rains. He was the one I always got in trouble with climbing mango trees and coconut trees against our parents' advice. So when Joe came home one day complaining that his belly hurt, he was taken to the clinic, diagnosed with malaria, only to die a few days later, it was devastating. Now, knowing what I know now as a physician, I know Joe didn't die from malaria, but malaria, as it was then and it is now, is the default diagnosis for whatever ails an African often delaying their true diagnosis and leading to unnecessary deaths. So that was the source of my dream, and as far as I've come from that child who grew up in Ghana, I haven't really forgotten that. Now, if this early life childhood experiences is what sowed the seed of my desire to be a physician, it's my mother who really nurtured that dream, and I think everybody needs a dream nurturer. My mother always emphasized to me seeing the positive aspects of failure and to extract lessons from my setbacks. Till, till I was age 10, my family was doing quite well. My dad's uh, pharmacy business was flourishing. And by any local accounts, we would be called a middle-class family on its way up. My father had come a long way together. He was the last of six children. His father died before he was age three. He was raised by his mother in a tiny village in the middle of Ghana. He was the only one amongst his siblings who had any form of ed education. So when my dad was leaving the village for the first time to go to the big city, we always call it the big city, his mother called him to his, uh, her bedroom and pointed to her bed. It was a rolled out straw mat on a bare clay floor it was where she had slept most of her adult life, where she laid when she was sick, and probably where she had all her children. And her mother told him, son, as you go to the big city, wherever you become, whatever you do, do not forget where your mother sleeps. Now, that moment became very profound to my dad. I know that because he told me that story many, many times. And to that, because of that, it became my guiding principle. Not remembering where my mother sleeps has meant so many things to me. It has meant that the skills that I've been privileged to gain are used to take care of people that I'll call the least amongst us. Now, 
my father, when, when he left the city and had his family of his own, wanted me to really learn what he had learned there. So the summer that I spent in my, my father's village with my grandmother is probably one of the best childhood experiences that I've had. I learned to work with my hands, to weave baskets, grow cassava, cultivate yam, learned to balance a bucket of water on my head, and more particularly, most especially, see where my grandmother slept. Now, as a Johns Hopkins surgeon, I live in the suburbs of Baltimore. I'm so far away from that life, but I've, it's still heartwarming for me, that culture, the culture that is so fond of streams and paths that links me back to that heritage that always wants you to honor your family's narrative and add positively to it, to live out your ideals. Now, in 1979, as a result of a military coup, my father lost his business, my mother lost his job as a banker, and over the course of a few years, our family's finances just spiraled down, and we became homeless and lived out of someone's garage. Now, being the first of eight children, plus the, those experiences, it helped me mature quite early. It also taught me to be a patient person and to think my problems out in a very non-conventional way. Now, those, those ways have actually helped me in some of the innovative surgeries that I've developed as a surgeon, because when I see a problem, I tend to think about it in ways that are not traditional, such as the surgery that we developed to be able to take brain tumors out, going through someone's eyelid, or weaving nerves together in people who have paralyzed faces so they can smile again. When I finished high school, I wanted to dream far beyond my borders. I wanted to study abroad. Why? Because I thought I would get a better education. Financially, I would do better so I can help my parents and also help pull my siblings up. Now, never mind that I knew my parents didn't have the finances to support such, a, such an ambition, but I, like I told you, dreams are free, right? So you can dream to be wherever you want to be. So I decided I was going to apply to schools in the US and in Europe. I spent all my money on postage stamps, and when you apply to a college, they usually want you to pay an application fee, which I didn't have. So I came up with a story. And because of the exchange rate in Ghana, please would you waive this application fee? Yeah. <laughs> Some universities waived them, others didn't. I got into many schools, but I never found the money to be able to go ahead. So I competed for whatever scholarship that came up. Fortunately, I won a scholarship to study medicine in Germany. I was thrilled. So I enrolled in a German language school and learned the German language, but unfortunately, at the last minute, when we were just about to leave, that spot that I worked so hard for was taken away from me and given to someone else whose family was more connected. Now, the most painful thing about that experience is that nobody even bothered to tell me what was going on for me to look for other alternatives. So as a compensation, the following year, this, we have what we call the scholarship secretariat, they manage all those scholarships. They offered that I can compete again for another scholarship. This time, it was to the Soviet Union. And I was glad I won a spot to study medicine, but it was a detour of major proportions. They offered me to study veterinary medicine and not human medicine. Now, veterinary medicine is not my dream, right? But sometimes in life, when your back is against the wall, a beggar has no choice, you look at your hands and say, this is what I have in my hands, and you do the best you can with it. So in August of 1990, I joined a group of students, and we chartered a plane and flew to Moscow. And then and there, I was to start my training to become a veterinary med a doctor. Now, the Rus Russia that I arrived in in summer of 1990, was breaking away from the former Soviet Union after seven decades. The previous year, the Berlin Wall had fallen. So you can imagine all these pivotal events of the 21st century happening in Europe. And where was I? I was behind the Iron Curtain, 
at the front row seat observing all this happening. I found it fascinating. Right? For my first year, I was assigned to a university in southern Russia in a city called Krasnodar. Krasnodar is named after Catherine the Great. That was where I was supposed to learn the Russian language alongside the first year medical uh, uh, school courses. My first month in Krasnodar was not spent in, le in a lecture hall. It was spent in a hospital. And not because I was ill. And not because they suddenly changed their mind to allow me to study human medicine. But during the first few days of class, a uniformed man came to the door, called my name out, summoned me out, and out on the street was a packed ambulance. They ushered me in, closed the door. Without a word, we drove for about 20 minutes. And when the door opened, I found myself in a Soviet-era hospital. I was taken to a room. My street clothes were taken off. I was given a hospital pajamas and flip-flops, and the door was locked. I sat down to think about what was going on. It didn't make any sense. I thought somebody made a mistake, and very soon they're going to just walk in, apologize, and take me back to school. But that didn't happen. I stayed in that room for four weeks. Every morning, a nurse would come and draw my blood. They would pass food to me through a small window. And the food they served didn't really appeal to my African senses. You know? <laughs> There's a bowl that they call soup that is transparent with some cabbage leaves floating around. If you know anything about soup in Africa, it's filled with vegetables and everything you can think of. Right? So that's what we're feeding me. One day, they made a mistake and didn't close the door. I escaped. I made my way out into the city tent, uh, center, and I ate so much ice cream. But imagine this. <laughs> Here is an African boy in pajamas in a southern Russian city in flip-flops playing hide-and-seek. Whenever I hear the siren come around, I would hide because I thought they were coming for me. Finally, when they allowed me to join the rest of my classmates, it had been four weeks of this ordeal. I had so much catching up to do. But by the end of the year, I was fluent in Russian language. I even represented African students on Russian language contests, and we won. Yeah. Uh, so it took me two years to really understand and find out why they put me in that room. They were looking for a malaria par parasite, but they found none. That tiny bugger still haunted me in, in, in Russia. For my second and subsequent years, I was transferred to Moscow, where I trained to be a, a veterinary doctor. Now, veterinary medicine is a fascinating thing, uh, field, one that I later found more difficult than human medicine, because you have to study all these species. One of the first specimens I studied was actually the Siberian tiger. My, my first patient was a horse. Now, there are similarities, don't take this wrong, similarities between humans and animals. Like, like humans, animals do get the flu, they break bones, they get cancer, right? Now, presently, when my patients find out that I studied and trained to be a vet doctor, it makes for some interesting conversation. <laughs> yeah. I have had patients who've asked me, can you help me treat my dog with vertigo? Yeah. Now, how about that tumor and that cancer? Now, I'm a facial plastic surgeon. The only one thing nobody has asked is plastic surgery for their dog. I'm waiting for that. <laughs> but by the early 1991, things were spiraling down economy-wise, economic-wise for Russia. There were a lot of queues. You know, for basic amenities, you can't just walk into a store and buy them. For as a foreign student, we had to re rely on our classmates to buy food for us, and of course, they jack up the price. If anybody recalls, in, about, in August of 1991, there was an attempted coup in Russia, what the Russians called the August Putsch. After that, things just got really bad. Foreigners became targets, foreign students became unwanted guests, and I felt this was not a place for me. Now, nothing happens in Russia without anybody knowing. You always have to be aware that there's somebody watching what you did. But I decided I had to escape. So what did I do? First, I started gathering, gathering my transcript. I had them translated into English, and I would mail them to London. Then I went to the UK embassy and the US embassy, 
and I was able to convince them to give me a travel visa. And then I boarded the train. I made it all the way to the border between Russia and Poland. At the train's border, I was whisked off the train, detained, and not allowed to go. So the next day, I um, ordered a safe box, put all my belongings in, bought another ticket, and tried again. And this time, I was able to go through. And I'll tell you something. I've given lectures in almost every continent you can think of, in every, in every country you can think of. The only place I haven't gone back is Russia. <laughs> okay? and, and I've ha been invited several, several times. So I made my way finally to Poland and to London. And in London, I stayed there for about three, four months. I worked in the school, scrubbing walls, um, scrubbing the floor, saving money to make my passage to the US. Now, I told you about those small things and small deeds done for me by my Samaritans. Once I got to the US, reality sort of sunk in. I didn't have anyone as a family, and I had little money on me. But one of my first Samaritans is a guy called Daniel. Daniel was a Ghanaian like myself. He had come to the US as a student in 1978. The same military coup that threw my family's fortunes off, 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 off um, the, um, its ascendancy also affected his family. So he could not finish what he came to do in the US. And in many ways, he told me his regret of not being able to achieve his dream. But what he, did he do for me? He encouraged me along. When Daniel asked me, so what do you want to do in America? I said, you know, I've always wanted to be a doctor. I want to be, do medicine, and I've pursued and wasted all my time in Russia. It's going to be too long. I don't have the money. I don't think I can do it. The thing that Daniel told me, and that's why I say the small things, small things, the things you tell people and the difference it can make, what he told me next was profound. He said, unless you plan on dying in 20 years, 20 years is going to come, and it better find you doing the things that you are passionate about. So don't give up on that dream. It was all I needed to hear. Thank you. Now, the interesting thing is, um, last year we had our national meeting in Dallas, and that's where Daniel lives. I called him and we were talking and chatting, and I asked him, do you remember what you told me that? He didn't have a clue what I was talking about. <laughs> Yeah. Small things that we tell people that makes big impact and you just move on. So for three months I stayed with Daniel. He was a mechanic. See, so he taught me how to work on cars. So now I can say I can work on anything that moves. Animals, humans, right? I finally got an admission into the University of Central Arkansas. I could afford that. It's about 20 minutes, miles north of Little Rock and I studied chemistry. It was in the chemistry department that I met my next Samaritan, my chemistry um, professor called Dr. Mannion. He also doubled as the advisor for students, pre-medical students. So one afternoon, I made an appointment. I met with him, and I told him, um, I'm interested in medicine. I wanted to study medicine. He, that's when he gave me a splash of reality. He said, you know, as a foreign student, it's almost impossible for you to get into the state medical school. In fact, I don't know any international or foreign student who has been able to make it from this university. But you could be the first. Now, from all the conversation and the millions or thousands of words he said that afternoon, there were two things that I heard. Almost impossible. That means not impossible, but almost impossible. And the next thing was that you could be the first. So I applied to the state medical school. Fortunately, I got in on early admission. Early admission means by January, whereas my classmates were waiting to hear, I already knew I had a spot. But I had to find the money. But that gave me eight months. I, I tutored Russian language. I tutored organic chemistry. I worked in a factory that makes school furniture. I did everything, and I saved enough to pay for my first year of tuition. I didn't care what was going to happen the second, third, year, fourth year. I didn't care. I just wanted to get in. Right? Now, again, just like it happened in Ghana, a week before we were to enroll and start school, I was told I could not enroll. The director of admissions called me and said, we didn't know you were a foreign student. You can't come. I said, that's not true. And that's putting it politely. 
Because yeah? I brought all the letters that her office had communicated with me with her signature, showing that I was a foreign student and that I was going to pay twice the amount of the tuition. And then they are telling me I can come. Now, in the end, the school gave me a compromise that was a no compromise. They said, we will defer your admission and give you a spot in the medical school class whenever you become a US citizen. It took me 25 years to become a US citizen. So disappointed that I couldn't go in, all the money that I had spent, I went back to graduate school and I studied physiology. By the second year, following year, I tried again. I applied to a different school and this time I was admitted into Mihari Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, I told you that one of the lessons I learned in my father's village was to balance a bucket of water on my head. There's a lesson that you gain from learning to balance a bucket of water on your head. You should try it, okay? First, you go to the well, you fetch the water, someone helps you put it on your head, and you take every step and it splashes and splashes, you get wet. By the time you get to where you're going, the bucket is half empty, half full. You pick which one you want. But you go back to the well and you fetch and you try and you try and gain and look at African women. It comes to a time with a straight posture. You can carry that bucket of water and you won't spill a drop. That was my experience into medicine. You try, and there's a near miss, but you try, and it's a near miss. And to achieve that dream, you have to try and try and try again till with a straight posture you can achieve that dream. That was my story. When I finished, when I realized that, okay, now I have a position in the medical school, I had to pay for it. Now, Mihari is a private school, it's not a state school, private schools are more expensive. I could not work or teach Russian language to gain enough, earn enough money. So I needed the money. I needed a loan, and I needed someone to co-sign the loan, and I could not find anyone. Everyone who helped me climb up that tree is very dear to me, but my chemistry professor stands out. One day I was on campus, he was jogging by, and he saw me and he asked, so what are you going to do next year? I told him, you know, I got, a, I got an admission, but I can't find the money. I needed someone to co-sign the loans. He told me, let me ask my wife. I said, oh, boy. <laughs> the, the wives are the practical ones, right? So it's not going to happen. But then he, they, came, they both agreed to co-sign the loan for me on one condition, that I do not disappoint them. So that's how I, I financed my way through medical school. After graduating from medical school, I did my training in otolaryngology and had the next surgery at the Mayo Clinic. It was five, a five-year program. After that, I went on to specialize in facial plastic surgery. And then after that, I was recruited to join the faculty at Hopkins. Now, most, a lot of people have asked me um, why I wanted to specialize in facial plastic surgery. I'll tell a little, a little bit uh, about that. But to go back, the Mayo Clinic is the same Midwestern hospital that I read in the encyclopedia that my parents bought me at age eight. And then I said, that's where I wanted to go. So dr dreams, <laughs> dreams do come true. The hustle is not free, but sometimes you get a little bit help from those we call our, our Samaritans. Now, there's a coda to the story about my chemistry teacher. After I had been at Hopkins for about uh, five years, I was presented with a two-year-old uh, patient. She was born, he was born without the ability to smile. He had been to a lot of medical centers, but because of his age, the traditional methods we use was not available to him. If he were to smile, it would need something unconventional, something innovative. So there was a surgery that I had conceptualized, but more, but more for someone more older. So I offered that to the parents, and three months after that surgery, the boy started to smile. It was so heartwarming when I got an email from his parents telling me, for the first time, I can see my son smile. Now, that's the, this is the twist. His father went on the internet, found my chemistry teacher, called him up, and thanked him for what he had done for me and send him a copy of his um, son's picture. Now, the act that my professor did for me, just like the tiny mosquito, has helped me help so many people. Here in the US, 
and people that I've helped on the surgical missions in my home country in Ghana, Bangladesh, Rwanda, Mexico, Peru. So tiny things and the power and the snowball effects that it has. Recent, not too long ago, I went to Ghana to do surgical mission and was presented with a child with a cleft lip deformity. It took me 45 minutes to fix that cleft lip um, deformity. And when I handed that baby to the mother, the mother started crying. And I thought I did something wrong. You know, plastic surgeons, we, we thrive on feedback. Oh, it looks so good. Uh, <laughs> now he was crying and um, I'm thinking I've done something wrong. But the more we tried to explain, the more agonizing her cry, her cry was. When he finally controlled herself, she said, if I knew that this could so simply be done, my other two children will be alive. So I would want to end with two ideas, both of them that are captured in African proverbs. The first is this, never forget the source of your dreams or your streams. And the second, if you think you are too small to make a difference, Try sleeping in a closed room with a mosquito. Thank you. <laughs>